All right, thank you. Thank you to both Jeff and Elliot. I've really enjoyed, I haven't been back to the campus since uh, 2000, so it's been interesting to see how many things have changed and how many things have not changed at all. So it's been very, a very exciting day for me. So yeah, I'm, as uh, Elliot mentioned, I'm gonna talk to you about Amaris, which is a bit different than your previous lectures because we're gonna be talking more about products that we've generated from synthetic biology and how we've developed that platform technology for generating more products. So first, as a scientist, I have to be an optimist, right? If you do an experiment and it fails, you have to be optimistic that the next one you're gonna do is going to succeed. With that, I might make forward-looking statements today, and please remember, I can't predict the future. So. All right, so today, I really wanna focus on three things about what makes Amherst different. The mission, our products, and our technology. So that's what we're gonna spend the next 45 minutes talking about, and hopefully you can see why you th I think Amherst is really trying to, to make a different world for us. First, a really big over overview of Amherst, which we have as an industrial bioscience company. Our mission is to apply inspired science to deliver sustainable solutions for a growing world. It was founded a little over 10 years ago by several postdocs from UC Berkeley. And we're headquartered in Northern California, near San Francisco. Here's our headquarters. But we also have both a pilot and demo facility, as well as a production facility in Brazil. We have around 400 employees, almost a third of which are PhDs. And we have over 300 issued patents as well as patent applications. All right, so now what is our mission? Well, Amherst was actually founded on how can we leverage our synthetic biology to cure malaria. So um, <laughs> and malaria kills up to a million people per year, often children. And what happens is, you have a mosquito, an infected female mosquito, that can bite a child, which could then infect them with a plasmodium and cause infections into the red blood cells. Malaria is, by and large, curable with artemisinin combination therapies. But the problem is artemisinin is derived from a plant, artemisinin annua, and availability is, is limited because of fluctuations of the growth cycle, as well as pricing. And so here is, you can see the, the cycle of a plant derived artemisinin takes 14 months for growing the plant, cultivating it, performing the extraction to then be derivatized into uh, artemisinin combination therapies. In the synthetic biology approach that we've generated, you have yeast cells where you perform a fermentation and then you produce artemisinic acid and through a series of chemistry steps produce artemisinin. You can see the time frame of 14 days to 14 months is significant for if you need to increase the amount of supply of this product. But how do we do it? Well, I, I'm gonna talk, walk you through. Here's our really big yeast cell where you feed sugar, and normally that sugar is then converted through a series of biochemical steps to ergosterol, similar to cholesterol in our membranes, ergosterol for yeast, it's essential. And what we did was we put in additional genes from the A annual plant here to produce um, artemisinic acid. But we wanted to ensure that we made a lot of artemisinic acid, so what we did was increase the amount of carbon that would be going through, the amount of carbon from sugar going through the isoprenoid pathway. And then we also decreased the amount going to ergosterol, and so that we could increase the amount of carbon to increase the titer and yields of our product. Through 22 genetic modifications, we were able to achieve in fermentations a yield of greater than 25 grams per liter. So this is the power of synthetic biology at the industrial scale. And then, as I mentioned, through four chemistry steps, this can be converted to artemisinin. And artemisinin, artemisinin is in production today. Sanofi Adventus has been the, started manufacturing using our yeast strain and in 2013 produced 20 million cures, and in 2014, 120 million cures. So this is really exciting, the impact that we're able to have using this technology on people's lives. But then the company thought, what else? What's next for us after developing and helping to in increase the number of cures of malaria that's present? We wanted to help improve the world's products, so how can we develop sustainable growth for our growing world? And so that leads me to discuss a little bit about what products were next. So looking at this same yeast cell that we did to make the anti-malaria artemisinin, 
it utilizes the isoprenoid pathway. And this is a great pathway for us to have chosen for our first product because the, the natural diversity that exists. There's more than 40,000 known isoprenoids and probably as many, if not more, that have yet to be discovered. These include farnesine, which I'll talk to you a lot more about as a building block molecule, which is also a 15 carbon product, as well as many natural fragrance oils and essential oils. If you would stop earlier in the isoprenoid pathway, you can make 10 carbon units that could be used for fragrances, jet fuels, and many other products. And even earlier in the pathway, diverting the carbon to make five carbon unit isoprene. So we chose as our first molecule to make post-artemisinin as farnesine, which is a building block molecule that can be used for many applications. I'm gonna speak a little bit in more in detail about the diesel, jet, and squaling. But the other products that we make are, we have a joint venture with um, Cosan from Brazil to make lubricants for base oils. We're also making surfactants from farnesine, plasticizers to make plastics more flexible and less brittle. Using simple chemistry, we make F and F molecules, and also then we make polymers such as for the, the tire industry. How we've had impact is that for our diesel fuel, more than 30 million kilometers have actually been driven using amorous cane diesel blends. Here's buses in Sao Paulo, Brazil, with a cane diesel blend, as well as a Rio bus running on 100% biodiesel. The diesel is having an impact because it has the lowest greenhouse gas emissions of all renewable diesel options with an 80% reduction compared to fossil fuel diesel. It also reduces the local emissions such as particulate matter and NOx and it has zero sulfur. And something I'm really excited to be able to talk about is our, our jet fuel that we've recently launched in that um, ASTM, stand, uh, ASTM approval this past summer has enabled commercialization of our Amherst Total Renewable Jet. And what you see here is a, a map of the world with some of the test flights and other commercial flights that we've done using blends of our jet fuel. Now to switch gears, I know some people throughout today had, had been asking me what type of products. And so, yes, we use, renew, we make renewable fuels, but we also actually make cosmetics. So Amherst Squalane is a 30 carbon unit that is derivatized from biofine. And squalane is something that naturally is in your skin. It's used in a lot of lotions to make your skin feel softer. But the problem really was the supplies prior to Amaris's squalane were sharks, which deep sea sharks were killed to, get, to harvest the squalane from their livers, or olives, which people like to eat. So the pricing and availability really is fluctuating there. And so since we've launched the product in 2013, we supplied 18% of the world of the squalane. So this is, I think, an example of seeing a need of where we can help stabilize supply, you know, pricing, and really help as the global need for these types of products expands, where synthetic biology and industrial biotechnology can help. So here's an overview of our entire product portfolio with consumer care division here. Cosmetics, where I discussed a little bit about squalane, and there's heme squalane, and also our flavored and fragrances with our partners that we've been involved in launching products. In performance materials, we have polymers and solvents and adhesive coatings. In renewable mobility, the diesel and jet. And finally, the, the lubricants of engine, transformer, and hydraulic in our joint, Novi, a joint venture called Novi with Cosan. That's an overview of all of our products, but you might want to know how do we actually make these at industrial levels and commercially relevant volumes. Here's this yeast cell that you've gotten used to seeing and saying, okay, we make all these different products. It's really versatile, but the problem is development is slow. It takes a lot of time and money. For Artemis in and alone, it took us nine years and 130 R&D person years. Now for every product that you wanted to develop took approximately 10 years with 10 to 15 employees each year. That's a lot of money you'd have to invest for any product you wanna do. So the question is, how can we make that cheaper and faster? So if your time to market is here for your target cost, what's the solution to make it a shorter time to market? The problem is, we don't know what we don't know. Biology is very complex. 
as, as soon as you think you know something, you find out something you don't know. And so really, you want to be able to try a lot of things. So we looked around and said, we wanted a platform technology that incre could increase our quantity and our quality of our speed to market. So if you would say that progress is, a, is proportional to the number of attempts versus the quality of attempts, if you use traditional approaches like I used in graduate school, you maybe could come up with a lot of ideas, you talk to people, but you have to decide on the top few you're going to test. And the truth is, I don't think we're very good at deciding what ideas are best. And so you might throw your five darts, and if you're lucky, one hits your bullseye. So Amos' approach is, we want to take a lot of darts and try to throw them, so that every time you hit the bullseye, you're more quickly and faster moving towards your target production. But we not only want to have more darts, we want to have a higher quality. We want to ha hit that bullseye faster, so you have fewer that just hit the wall rather than the board. So how do we do that? Well, we really looked at how can we learn from other industries, what they've done. So take the car industry. First, they developed a pipeline, and then to increase both throughput and quality, they automated it. We took the same general idea of how can we build an assembly, assembly line for knowledge. And so what we do at Amaris is we build strains through mutagenesis, meiosis, and automated strain engineering. And we can build millions of strains per month. But then you need to be able to screen them and test. So initially, we use 96 well screening platform, where we're looking at about 120,000 strains per month. Then we really have to decide which of these strains are best for the, the, the product we're looking for to then screen a much smaller number, say 60 strains per month, in our half and two liter fermenters. Strains that look better in performance that we believe we might want to take to manufacturing, we would then put in our pilot facility for 300 liter to look at both recovery, I'm sorry, for both fermentation and recovery operations. So looking at not just how much of the product you produce, but how much of it can you actually recover. And then finally, a few strains per year make it to manufacturing at 200,000 liter scale. One thing that's extremely important here is all of the data that we're taking in at each of these time points so that we can learn and design better, so that we can always increase the chances of hitting that bullseye. At Amherst, we've really tried to adopt an engineering cycle where you have your design, build, test, learn. But we've wanted to take it to the nth cycle so that you can test many different ideas at once. And so what we've done is you design using computer-aided design, build with robotics and automation, and then test again with automation, and use all that data to learn for your new designs. Using this process for automated strain engineering, we've been able to reduce the cost to, for generating each strain in four years by 95%. And for, with only three weeks and four employees, we can make a thousand different genotypes with many cycles per year. So now I'm going to go into each part of the cycle in a little bit more detail about what we do specifically. So first, we'll talk about design and build. Now, traditionally, when I was in grad school, maybe here even at MUD, what you do is when you have an idea and you want to plan it. Actually, back when I used to do this, I even did it on paper. I know now there's much more automated programs. But you think about what you want to do, what gene you maybe want to overexpress, the integration of into the genome where you would want it to put it. You design regions of homology, primers that you want to amplify, all of these things by hand, do a lot of copy and pasting. Your oligos come in and you do some manual construction. And a good scientist can maybe make 20 strains per week. What we've done at Amaris is using computer-aided design. So you have to come up with your idea. But all of the ordering and the designing of the primers and any region of homology are done automatically for you. There's a robotics platform to put it together. And 350 strains per week are generated. And so this is the automated strain engineering platform, which really what we've tried to do is how can we design um, and build faster and better, which has three components. A molecular biology component, which is our, really our modular DNA assembly platform. An automation compo component, which allows for automated scripts for our robots. And then our software, so computer-aided design and integrated databases. So this is the basis of all of our build. Here's a, some of uh, the software that really helps turn an idea you might have into a strain. Your experience as a user would be that you would paste your strain ideas 
onto an online form, wait a few weeks, and then receive an email to get your, your new strains data and where they were put in the minus 80 freezer. What, the, what you would do for entering your data is here, and I'll walk you through this, is our Thumper database software. You would type in a, basically a shorthand that scientists use. Here is the locus that you would want to go into, ERG9. You maybe would want to overexpress a pr protein such as ERG10 with using a promoter that you can change whichever promoter you want. Here it's TDH3. You might want to knock out ERG9 with overexpressing this or potentially knock out ERG9 overexpressing ERG10 and also overexpress ERG13 with a different promoter. If you didn't want to use the shorthand, but you wanted to use existing parts in our library, we also have the software enables drag and drop construction of pieces. And in the background, what happens, this Thumper software helps, you, helps to determine what genetic elements need to be added to our library, designs and orders primers, generates the robot instructions, and tracks all the movements in our limb system. So everything's barcoded, and so that we can later go back and data mine. And here's an example of a common DNA uh, a piece that would be put together and integrated. You have an upstream piece where this is where it's going to integrate into your genome. A promoter for the first gene of interest that you, you wanted to overexpress or integrate. Two additional genes with a bifunctional promoter. And then a mar portion of a marker. Here's the other half of the marker with regions of homology here. Another gene with a promoter that's bidirectional and then finally another. This allows you to have six different genes present. We put it in two pieces together, along with your region of homology where you wanted to integrate, and you transform, and you, have all, you are able to insert six different genes into one place while deleting one, one gene in the genome. And here, I can just, I'll walk you through. We have to have some fun videos. So over here on the left, upper left, what you'll see is, this is strain banking. So these are stocks of yeast that are transformed with the DNA, so the, the constructs that we tried to make. They're automatically stored into cryovials so that later, if there's one of these that's interesting to us, we can then go back into the minus 80 freezer and have it pulled out. On the upper right-hand side over here, what's happening is it's actually phenotyping the strains you've made. So it can be testing it for whatever you want it to, for the titer of the product you're looking for, for the growth of the product. This instrument right here, the exciting thing about it is it can actually do multiple steps at once. Down in the bottom left here, what's happening is we're plating onto 96 well, or sorry, 48 quadrant agar plates. So you might be familiar with circular agar plates where you plate for DNA. Here it's a similar thing, it's just in a 48 quadrant. So what's happening is we had a transformation of all of that DNA into those yeasts to see what would happen. And we've identified dilutions that will enable single colonies to be grown. And so these dilutions are occurring there. And then after a few days in an incubator, we have an automated picking that occurs. You can pick the size or any other characteristics of the colonies you want to pick. It picks it in 96 well. And after it picks it here, gosh. Sorry for that. After it picks it, it's going to go inoculate a 96 well plate for media so that you can grow it up for doing phenotyping testing, and then what happens is it, after it fully inoculates it, it goes into an ethanol bash, bath to sterilize it, and then it will have a UV light shown on it so that it can then pick another plate. Again, all of this in the computer, it's cataloging the size of the colony you picked, other characteristics so that later you can identify if there was a pattern there that was interesting. So one measure of ASE's contribution to Amherst is that you now can test any idea you have many times over. And so here you see a graph of when we introduced automated strain engineering, the rate of strain construction increased significantly. And here is just a measure of the bank size. On the left-hand side is the total number of pieces in our library or parts. And so over 40,000 parts. And the reason that we save these is 
maybe you wanted to test one idea with one promoter or six different combinations of genes, and you said, you know what, I actually want to try a different combination. Or for a new product, you might want to try a slightly different combination. Instead of having to remake all these pieces, here we can just go into the freezer and grab them. On this side, it just shows the million base pairs. And to help you get an order of the size and the magnitude of what we've produced, this is the yeast genome size. And here is the size of the human coding genome. So in our freezer, we have quite a bit of DNA that we're able to pull out and reuse as we're looking for how to improve new products. All right, so that's how we design and build. But how do we test? Because you can create a lot of things, but if you don't have a good way to test them, it doesn't really matter. And the, what matters to me is how can we have our testing at our 96 well, small scale, be relevant to the manufacturing? Because it doesn't matter if you have a strain that's fabulous in 96 well plate titers, but dies after one day in fermentation. And so what we found is that testing numerous small scale models is useful for predicting large scale performance. So you may look at measurements of product titer. How much of it does it make? Product transport, how well does it get out of your cell? The genetic stability. Over a period of time, does it continue to make the product at the same rate or does it go down? Viability, does your product kill your cell? And then finally, how well does it grow? And looking at the different growth conditions of the different types of carbon, the, the carbon availability and growth conditions of temperature, pH, whatever you would want to test. And then combine these to try to find a predictive model of for fermentation performance. And the reason we done, have done this is if you look at one assay and look at its correlation to tank performance, such as viability, your R squared is pretty low. If you add a second assay, you could increase it. Here, adding a third increases it further, a fourth and fifth. And then finally, a sixth really helps you so you can have a better expectation of performance in a fermenter using this. So what we found, again, is that no single plate correlates with fermentation performance. Here, with all of these for looking at fermentation performance of farnesine, the best you see is, is a 0.54. And the consequences of this is it's not clear which of these strains you would, should put into your fermenters. If you pick all of the top ones, some of them might perform really poorly. And the problem with this is you could end up with a lot of false positives, and with that, you wouldn't have any improvement. And something I worry about more is that you could end up having a lot of false, false negatives. And so that things that really could be having a huge impact you're not seeing. But this is part of the reason we've really invested in scientific computing at Amaris is doing a multivariate aggression, regression has enabled us to predict fermentation performance much better than a single assay. And the exciting thing here is that we also have seen similar results upon scale up. So this slide, sorry, it's a little bit busy, but let me walk you through it. So these, we have three different farnesine producing strains. And here is the, just their yield. The plus signs here represent performance at lab scale. The diamonds represent performance at pilot scale. And the circles represent performance at full, full scale. And what you see is for all three strains, the performance at two liter is comparable to that of the performance at the 200,000 liter. And that's very important to us so that we can predict what our performance is going to be at that manufacturing scale. Now I hope next time I come here or next time you hear about Amherst, we can add to this the predicted fermentation graph of where our 96 well model, 96 well plates show, and that would be, I think, a great, great thing to be able to show you. All right, and that's where the learning comes in. How can we learn so we can continue to get better? So at all stages of our screening process and building process, we're trying to learn. We're collecting data to try to improve it. So data is going in and out of our limb sister, our computing, and our data analysis at every step of the process, from strain screening all the way back to manufacturing, where we can get real-time data on our performance. And our automated data management system helps us to data mine. So at each step in the build of DNA constructs, in the screening, using our high throughput screening, as well as in our fermentation, with everything is barcoded and gone and, and put into our laboratory information management systems. And each of these are databases specifically for that program and department. But that data then is put into primary warehouses, which then relationships can be developed for data marts so that a scientist 
doesn't have to look at each single one and try to, try to put it all together, but that a data mart will help and pull out and help you identify patterns that you wouldn't necessarily have seen on your own. This enables us to make real-time data-driven decisions. Now, this seemed, when you discuss it, like, oh, this makes sense. But I will say, I think it's not as easy to implement as it seems on paper. And I think one thing we've done right at Amherst is invested many man hours or man years in, in developing our computational ability to really be able to learn, gather our data, and learn from it and mine it. And really what's next is, I think we were, someone was asking about this earlier today about the relationship between phenotypes and genotypes. And this is something we want to be able to do. And this is the next frontier. How can we data mine the genotype-phenotype relationship to improve the strain designs across multiple products? And so you can look at all of the carbon-15 units that you may see and say, or carbon-15 products and say, what's common here that's different than when I'm making a 10 carbon product? What, what seems to have efficacy in one? that doesn't in the other. To do that, we need to have confidence in our phenotypes and our genotypes. So one thing we've really invested in is in increasing and improving our QC for our genotypes to make sure there's no errors and so that what we think we're testing is really what we're testing. And then being confident in our phenotypic assays. And then finally, we really need improved software to identify complex patterns. As I was saying, I think at dinner, how I believe that uh, data scientists are really important in this field and many others. So I think that's really what's the future. And so continuing to improve the cycle. One thing I think that we invest in at Amherst is infrastructure. How do we continue to improve our structure, in our, our process to just increase the, the rate of product design? So one way is to build faster. So to, to move from one product, such as farnesine, to, say, another product, fragrance oil, it requires multiple changes. If we wanted to make a product at commercially relevant levels, many genes would have to be added and deleted, which would require multiple integrations. And this is something we did last year to enable commercialization of our product, our first fragrance product. So the traditional method of engineering, if you wanted to change four loci, took six weeks, because what you would do is you'd do, look at your new gene, you'd make a construct with your new gene, a marker with your regions of homology, and do homologous recombination into your old gene. You'd then need to loop out your marker, and then do it again for the other three. So it would, could take up to six weeks. Using nucleus-induced nucleus -induced double-strand breaks what, in, with your donor DNA, where you have still these regions of homology that can patch your breakage, we can actually change those same four loci in one week with no markers. So this is helping us reduce the cycle time of testing new ideas for new products. We also are trying to build smarter. And this is actually a part of, part of the science here that I think I, I get really excited about and I, uh, is what we've done here with building smarter. Here, it's a new, new shape for the yeast cell that I'm showing you, but each of these circles represents a node on the step of sugar going to farnesine. Here's glycolysis, your TCA, making of ethanol, and the isoprenoid pathway. Yeast converts sugar to farnesine using the native central metabolic network and the plant farnesine synthase. But the truth is, the native pathway costs ATP, waste carbon, and has redox imbalances because it wasn't made to try to produce a commodity product. <laughs> but we wanted to replace the native central metabolism, which we've termed first generation, with a synthetic alternative that could, probably, that could help us increase our yield. So the, so the scientists at Amherst identified that in the first generation pathway, you had a 23.8% max yield off of sugar. What that means is if you fed 100 grams of sugar to your yeast, you could make 23.8 grams of farnesine. The second generation pathway that they put together would enable a 28.6% max yield, so 28.6 grams out of 100 grams of sugar fed, which is a 20% theoretical increase by glucose, but more importantly, a maximum yield from oxygen, so your productivity for oxygen, by 170%. That's great, because it's theoretical, but what happened when we really tried to implement this? Well, we implementing the synthetic metabolism improved the yield from glucose by 15%. So here you see the relative farnesine made per sucrose consumed. The circles represent the second generation, 
and the triangles represent the, the first generation native. And the yield over more than 13 days of fermentation was significantly higher for the second generation pathway than the first. And this is per sugar consumed. This, the same is true for oxygen consumed, but you actually see an improvement of more than 70% from the second generation with these green circles compared to the, the first generation and the triangles. And I think this is, this is what gets me really excited, that the theoretical limit for the farnesine to oxygen ratio of the native pathway is here shown in this dotted line. And so we have actually engineered our strains to perform beyond the theoretical limits of the native metabolism, which I think is something you think about. These are types of strategies you think about that maybe you could do when you're in graduate school. It's kind of the things that get you excited. And we're doing it, and we're doing it in strains that are producing at 200,000 liter scale. So I think it's a really exciting, exciting science. Here's just a pretty picture of our yeast cells. Here's the sugar, and here's the biofarnesine oil that they're producing. And potentially a, a prettier picture for me is showing how the trajectory of, in 2008, when I joined Amaris, we saw drops of farnesine in a, a microcentrifuge tube, and we're excited. And two years later, we saw liters of product. And in 2013, millions of liters produced. And our beautiful facility in Brotes, Brazil, that's producing our products. What I was talking to you about is how do we improve our cycle? And one measure of it is the time, to, time to, to market, or another way is how do we get to certain measures? Well, so one measure is how, how high can you get your titers? Now, we wanted to go beyond 40 grams per liter, but this is an example of how can we decrease the rate to a certain time, to a certain point in fermentation. For farnesine, it took over two years. For the first fragrance, about 18 months, and the second fragrance product, under a year. And so really what we're trying to do is how can we decrease the amount of time and money to get to production level values. So Amaris overall, we, like to, we use sugar and our industrial biotechnology platform to make products. And our mission is to really use industrial biotechnology to develop sustainable solutions for the growing world. Our products help provide solutions, and our technology enables speed to the target molecule, and we consistently are striving to improve. So thank you.